Hey guys, welcome to my channel. I hope you're all doing very well and welcome to a very special video because yes, for the fourth consecutive time, today we are going to be going through the very best movies of the year. The year in question being 2022. <laughs> okay, because I am filming this now in 2023, but I am so excited to dive into my top 10 kind of, not really, picks <laughs> of the best films that came out last year this is an annual tradition that I have here on my channel stemming back decades or at least four years so I'm really really excited to dive into this video now before we get into my picks for the very best films that came out in 2022 I do have a couple of disclaimers okay so first of all I have already posted my best TV shows of 2022 video it's up on my channel now so you can go ahead and check it out if you're curious to see what made the list and second Secondly, as I always say, when it comes to any of these top 10, top 20, top 50 <laughs> lists that I make here on my channel, they are of course based off of my personal preference, what I like, you know, what I enjoyed from the year, um, and also based off of what I was able to see. Um, because especially after the pandemic, there have been fluctuations in release dates, you know, some films have been pushed back or pushed forward, um, and especially here in the UK, the release dates are a little bit inconsistent for instance Puss in Boots isn't coming out until February here so like bear with me <laughs> bear with me everyone keeps saying Puss in Boots is so good oh my god you can't believe how good Puss in Boots is and I'm like well I'm gonna have to wait a while to see how good Puss in Boots 2 is okay because it's coming out in February here in the UK literally we're the last country to get it so you know cut me some slack okay cut me some slack there are some films that I haven't been able to see yet but I tried my best to catch up on the films in particular in December because I hadn't been watching too many throughout the year but I think I have a pretty decent list at this point to the point where I predictably exceeded my limit of 10 films oops <laughs> the same thing happened with the tv shows guys so I'm not surprised but yeah uh, we have more than 10 films here but we're gonna call the rest honorable mentions to make it fair and my final point is as per usual if you haven't already please be sure to subscribe to my channel and make sure you turn your notifications so that you can be told when I upload next. Now without further ado guys let's dive into the very best films of 2022 according to me <laughs> and we're gonna start off with the honorable mentions. Okay, so now that we've gone through the honorable mentions, it's time to bring out the big guns, guys. It's time to dive into my list of the top 10 movies of 2022. And starting us off at number 10, we have Matilda the Musical. Matilda the Musical is an adaptation of Matilda the Musical. <laughs> Matilda the Musical being a Broadway slash West End musical <laughs> uh, which was incredibly popular and of course was a, a stage adaptation of the famous Roald Dahl book. Now this film of course had some big shoes to film being the second film adaptation uh, of this famous story after the 1996 movie which is a film that was truly a staple in my childhood. Guys, I, I can't tell you how many times I watched the original Matilda movie. I I really can't. <laughs> it's a shocking amount. I'm so, I, I used to watch that thing on repeat, you know, on cassette. Like, it, it was a part of my childhood, okay? So I was nervous going into this film. The stakes were high. But boy, was I just so full of surprise. And I, I just felt so warm inside having seen what they were able to do with this brand new adaptation of this beloved story. I think they absolutely knocked it out of the park when it came to this version of Matilda by really allowing it to stand out from the previous adaptation. Of course, it is a musical, so it has that dynamicism to it uh, where, you know, the characters are breaking out into song 
and with this musical aspect they're really able to capture the joy and cheekiness that perfectly suits this childhood story we also have some amazing performances from truly talented actresses particularly we have emma thompson portraying this version of miss trunchbull who is as ghastly <laughs> and awful as ever and the prosthetics that they use to manifest this character were really really effective but we could still see the glimpses of emma thompson you know shining through with her brilliant portrayal of this horrible character and then on the flip side of things you have lashana lynch portraying miss honey who is just so delicate and so weedy um you feel for this character as you did in the you know original film adaptation and you just want her to break out of her shell and, and grow a backbone so she could stand up to miss trunchbull i think lashana lynch did a fantastic job portraying this character and making her just on the right side of pathetic so she doesn't become annoying <laughs> and i think considering her previous performances in the woman king and even the james bond no time to die movie that we got last year i think lashana lynch is demonstrating just how much range she has as an actress and it's impressing me more and more although i'm not surprised because i am her number one fan like i <laughs> okay i am the head of the lashana lynch uh, fan club so like i'm not even surprised now i have to give a special shout out to the titular character herself matilda who is portrayed by alicia weir who i think was absolutely fantastic in this film i think she did an exceptional job as the lead of this movie having such a huge production on her small but capable shoulders um was really quite the feat that she absolutely rose to the occasion for overall when it comes to matilda the musical i think it does an exceptional job of bringing that energy and vibrancy to the story which allows it to stand out from the previous film adaptation that is much beloved and it also introduces this story to a whole new generation and i have to say another aspect of this film that i really really love is the fact that it is a non-animated non-superhero or non-franchise family film those are so so rare to come by these days i don't know if you guys have noticed but a lot of the time the family films that we get nowadays are you know within the marvel dc umbrella or they are animated films but matilda the musical is just a brilliant classic live action family film for all to enjoy and i think that's wonderful now next up at number nine we have a slightly less joyful and cheerful entry with the banshees of inishirin now the banshees of inishirin is set in the 1920s in this mythical place in ireland called inishirin where we have our two main characters uh padrick and colm now they've had a friendship for many many years but colm one day decides to end that friendship abruptly for no real reason leaving Patrick really distraught and confused about why Colm has decided he no longer wants to hang out with him now throughout the film we see Colm coming up with all of these vague reasons like Patrick is too kind and plain and uninteresting and these critiques really get to Patrick emotionally and he starts to doubt himself and his self-esteem is very much affected by Colm's comments and his behavior towards him but Patrick Patrick is determined to try and patch up whatever issues they have and it takes Colm literally promising to cut off his fingers <laughs> every time Patrick approaches him uh, to get Patrick to finally back away and the whole situation escalates to the point where they're really just malicious and antagonistic towards each other and it was really sad and emotionally affecting to see the breakdown of this friendship play out throughout the film but it's even sadder still when you consider that this film essentially acts as a really clever allegory for the uh, division of Ireland in the 1920s and the breakdown of the relationship between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland throughout the 20th century. Now as compelling as the storyline is and as impressed I was to see that it was this really clever allegory for Ireland in the 20th century, I was mostly enraptured by the other storylines. In particular we have Kerry Condon portraying Siobhan uh, who is Patrick's sister who yearns to seek a better life for herself away from this small town and so she moves away and it's such a bittersweet moment because there was always this feeling of her being capable of so much more but she was held back by her 
geographical circumstances. And then on the flip side of things, you have Barry Keegan giving the performance of a lifetime. Oh my goodness, this guy killed in this film. Oh my goodness. It just reminds me, again, it gives me yet another reason to be angry at Marvel for wasting these incredible actors. But anyway, Barry Keegan gives a, a, a phenomenal performance, as does Kerry Condon. Ugh, please, they're both excellent but in the case of Barry Keegan he portrays the town simpleton he is someone who has a learning difficulty he's not taken seriously in the town and what's even worse is that his father who's a police officer he's the police chief of the town abuses him sexually abuses him emotionally abuses him and so he just has such a rough life but the one person that he is able to connect to and speak to is Padraig uh, but he of course is no longer in the right state of mind after his best friend just abandoned him and so you see Barry Keegan's character Dominic just be you know lost in this island all alone having to go through the abuse at home and having no one else to turn to when Patrick kind of turns his back on him and goes down this road of darkness but the one other bright light that he does have is Patrick's sister um, Siobhan who he kind of fancies like he likes her but there's this like excruciating scene <laughs> what that is this the saddest most excruciating most memorable scene of the entire of 2022 honestly that scene between Siobhan and Dominic I, I was underneath the bed underneath the floor <laughs> I won't spoil too much about what happens in that scene but all I'll say is in that moment that's when I knew Barry Keegan Kerry Condon deserved all the praise <laughs> okay so next up at number eight we have a super unknown very underrated independent British film that technically came out in 2021 but the, the wide release was in 2022 so it counts still um and that is Boiling Point now Boiling Point stars Stephen Graham as this chef who works in a very popular restaurant in London in an area that I was very familiar with okay because I used to live in that area so when I saw the glimpses of the street that they show you I was like really happy <laughs> because I recognize it anyways um but this film is centered on one single night in this extremely busy restaurant where we are following the chefs and you know the cooks in the restaurant as they try to navigate service during this extremely busy night now this film is filmed in a way to make it look like it's all one shot as we explore all different corners of this extremely cramped and busy kitchen there are definitely cuts throughout that are hidden very well but the whole point is to fully immerse the audience into this extremely stressful environment as the cooks all work together to try and deliver a an excellent service and on top of that you also happen to have a critic who comes in and so the stakes are really high for the restaurant and especially for Stephen Graham's Andy who is the head chef in the restaurant but even though this film is essentially set in one single evening I was so impressed by first of all the fact that they made it feel like such an immersive experience through this kind of one take gimmick that they do really really well but secondly that the way that they're able to kind of incorporate all of these different storylines without having a whole flashback without really leaving the kitchen they're able to convey so much about each of these characters particularly Andy uh, through the dialogue and also through you know what you see him doing and his behavior throughout the film so it was just really impressive to see that storytelling be so confined um, in this kitchen but not limited by it. Now, the cast also gave fantastic performances portraying these characters in particular Stephen Graham as the head chef Andy and also his sous chef Vinette Robinson who portrays Carly. Those two were fan fantastic in this film and as you are you know taken through all of the different trials and tribulations and stresses of working in a restaurant especially during peak hours you really empathize with these characters as you get to know them a bit better and understand their relationships and um, and also as you see how customers treat them oh my goodness there's one scene with a waitress who's coming up against an annoying customer and I was just like I this is why I can never work customer service this it would be murder every day <laughs> the 
<laughs> it would be murder every day guys and you would not catch me working in customer service i couldn't do it <laughs> it would be federal crimes left right and center <laughs> and also i have to say one of the main reasons why i wanted to feature this film on this list of course because it's an excellent film and you would absolutely enjoy it if you give it a chance but also because it's such an excellent companion piece to the bear if all of this sounded very familiar you might be thinking hmm, i've heard that before and that's because a lot of the same um themes that are explored in boiling point are explored in the bear you know in this like longer series and so i would highly recommend you guys if you haven't watched the bear yet for whatever reason you can watch these two together as a double bill <laughs> it will be fantastic or if you've really seen the bear then definitely check out boiling point maybe you're gonna rewatch the bear i don't know but either way if you like the bear you need to watch boiling point these two together are dynamite because on the one hand you have the bear which like i said is a longer form storytelling you explore several different days and months with carmen in the kitchen trying to renovate his brother's uh, restaurant but on the other hand you have boiling point which is just just contained to one very busy evening with you know the kitchen staff just going crazy trying to get out these orders mistakes are being made you know all sorts of chaos is happening in that kitchen and it just emphasizes the stress of working in that kind of environment which is what Carmen is very much um, familiar with on a daily basis in the best so these two together are just a match made in heaven so next up at number seven we go from a very small indie british film that is super unknown to a huge mega blockbuster big deal <laughs> film that made a ton of money at the box office unexpectedly and that is top gun maverick now top gun maverick was just such a shock to many of us right i mean the thing that really stands out to me about this film is the theater going experience that to me is what makes it just levels above a lot of the other films that i watched last year i just remember sitting there and seeing those you know flight sequences and just being in awe and you could feel it you, you could feel the tension you could it was palpable and that is because they were using actual aircraft <laughs> that is because tom cruise is wild and crazy and he wanted to do it the right way and so he got those actors on the aircraft okay he did it in association with the air force and they made it happen and that just makes all the difference to me sitting there in the cinema watching those sequences in the air was just breathtaking i'll never forget that cinema going experience and that like i said to me is what makes this film stand out from the crowd and that's pretty impressive considering that this year we also got a spectacular cinema going experience in avatar 2 but i do think that there's something so much more visceral and, and personal and palpable attention filled <laughs> all the adjectives about top gun maverick that avatar 2 failed to really reach now at the end of the day i fully recognize that top gun maverick is just like military propaganda or air force propaganda to be fair <laughs> okay it's very americana it's very back in the old days things were better kind of aesthetic and vibe so it was able to bring both sides of the political spectrum together to enjoy this film which is quite an achievement in such a divisive world um but at the end of the day i, I recognize it for what it is <laughs> which is air force propaganda but still an excellent film nonetheless really great quality air force propaganda <laughs> okay so next up at number six we have our very first comic book adaptation entry with the batman now i've talked to death about the batman at this point i have a whole long ass review on it and i mentioned it in my best batman movies ranking from earlier this year which you can check out so i'm gonna keep this one brief but you know all there is to say is that the batman is good you know <laughs> <laughs> the Batman is good. Oh, breaking news, right? Like it's it's a good film. Matt Reeves absolutely understood the assignment. He did what needed to be done. All of the cliches of the internet from 2022 applies to the situation because uh, he absolutely knocked it out of the park. Uh, what really stands out to me is this manifestation of Gotham. I think is just so unique, and I think it's so welcome because, of course, you know we've had so many Batman movies. We have so many iterations of this character but i think something that has been lacking you know in christopher nolan's version in, in Zack snyder's version is a very distinct 
version of Gotham with a very unique aesthetic and that kind of gothic kind of aesthetic that we saw Tim Burton realize was very distinct but since then we haven't really seen anyone try something spectacularly new with the city of Gotham itself but then 20 years later in came Matt Reeves with an incredible location scout and was able to give us some really amazing visuals for this new version of Gotham and as someone who had the pleasure of going to Scotland last year and seeing some of the actual places that they used uh, for the scenes um, and I also had the pleasure of visiting the Liver building which is the town hall and that's actually in Liverpool <laughs> um, so I, I've seen these places in real life and just the idea of a location scout being like okay that's going to be a part of this new Gotham that's going to be a part of it you know using all of these different aspects of the British uh, city skylines I think was just spectacular I have a greater appreciation of that after having seen these buildings in broad daylight without the like sunset background um, that's very prevalent in the Batman movie. But the Batman isn't just about aesthetics even though it does aesthetics very very well we also have an incredible cast here with the almost unrecognizable Colin Farrell and the amazing Zoe Kravitz as the new Catwoman. We have a younger more rough and ready version of the iconic father figure that is is Alfred uh, as portrayed by Andy Serkis who I would have loved to see even more of and then at the center of the story of course of course we have Robert Pattinson as Batman aka Bruce Wayne who absolutely knocked it out of the park especially with the Batman scenes I did take umbrage okay umbrage with his um Bruce Wayne scenes I, I don't think his Bruce Wayne is quite there yet but that's okay because this is like an origin story for this version of the character so we're gonna see an evolution hopefully with his depiction of Bruce Wayne but in the case of Batman like oh he just knocked it out of the damn park didn't he like he absolutely knocked it out of the park <laughs> He did what needed to be done. He did the actoring. And of course, any review of the Batman, no matter how long or short, would not be complete without mentioning the one and only Michael Cicchino. <laughs> <laughs> who absolutely nailed the theme the score wow like the the score for the batman remains one of the best scores of the, the whole of 2022 we've come out the other end now so i can say this with with true confidence okay michael giacchino's score for the batman it was even better than his score for his own movie the uh, werewolf by night you know even the werewolf by night had great music but the batman score like he put something he put a special kind of crack in there <laughs> <laughs> that was a very special score he absolutely nailed it okay so now we're diving into the top five picks for the best films of 2022 and starting us off at number five we have Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio now this is a film that of course recently came out on Netflix although I would have loved to see this in cinemas and it is the I don't know 500th adaptation of the classic Italian tale that was most famously depicted uh, by Disney in their 1940s animated film but here we have a completely different version that takes on a darker tone it's a bit more uh, realistic in terms of its depiction of the the um, timeline you know the the series of events that are playing out in Italy during this actual time and the film itself uses another form of animation it uses stop-motion animation which further distinguishes it from the the uh, Disney film from the 1940s but overall what really stands out here with Guillermo del Toro's take on this story um, is not just the fact that it's dark but it's just full of substance you know it's full of meaning and weight and I think it, that's what really struck me about this film you know it dives into the character of Pinocchio as a human being as an actual person before he even becomes a real boy as a person who realizes early on that he has been manifested on this planet and this father figure that he has 
has all of these huge expectations of him that he doesn't really know what to do with and that drives him to a completely different direction in life which lands him in a really dark hole that is surrounded by real life historical context of Italy in the early 20th century and in the end you have that full character arc where he realizes what he really wants to be and what he really wants is to be accepted by Giuseppe for who he really is rather than having to imitate Giuseppe's late son. Okay so next up at number four we're really getting into my favorites here because we have Glass Onion and Knives Out Mystery. I love this movie I really do I just think it's so good it's so fun it was just a breath of fresh air and it was much needed this December I must say but this is yet another film that I already have a review on on my channel so if you want to hear more of my thoughts on this one you can go ahead and check that out but all I'll say is that Ryan Johnson just killed it with this sequel it's very rare that a sequel will be better than the first film and I think that's definitely the case for a uh, glass onion because it's just so damn clever I mean you have the classic social commentary that we've come to expect in these Knives Out movies the first Knives Out movie which I recently re-watched and I enjoyed it much better than I remember the first time I watched it in cinemas but the first Knives Out movie dealt with the white liberal upper middle class and their hypocrisy and it was during the kind of Trump era where that kind of commentary was hot but for the sequel once again Ryan Johnson has identified another hot topic to comment on this time around surrounding the emergence of the billionaire status right the the billionaire culture that we're starting to see become pervasive in society and normalized in society um, I think he just made some really great observations about that whilst at the same time giving us yet another um, investing murder mystery next up at number three we have Black Panther Wakanda forever now this is yet another film that I've already reviewed so you can go ahead and check out the review on my channel if you want to hear more of my thoughts on this one but I really really loved this film I, I felt like it was the best case scenario considering the difficult um, hand that Ryan Coogler had been dealt um, in the wake of the death of Chadwick Boseman. I thought the film ended up being a really beautiful touching tribute uh, to Chadwick Boseman and to the character of T'Challa as we'd seen him previously in the MCU um, and I thought they did a really great job of allowing Shuri to take on the mantle of the Black Panther and you know fully exploring how her um, rise to this position was different to that of her brother and the anger that she felt because she had lost so much um, that it, it tainted her world view it led her to a dark path that was more akin to Killmonger's as opposed to her brother um, T'Challa's so that was a really interesting exploration of the character and then of course we had the introduction of Namor more and the people of Talokan who are you know the sea dwellers um, who also have access to vibranium and that was a really clever way of incorporating this other storyline surrounding the CIA who of course were hunting down this highly valuable um, material to use for nefarious means so I just think that Ryan Coogler did a really great job of writing this sequel I think all of the storylines were symbiotic they connected really really well and made for a very uh, compelling uh, sequel to this incredibly highly regarded first film and aside from Ryan Coogler's excellent writing and directing once again you had brilliant performances from all the cast in particular you have Letitia Wright standing up again as Shuri but a different version of the character in light of everything that she's been through at this point and then you have Angela Bassett coming in as Queen Ramonda just giving the most powerful performance of the year um, as she expresses how much pain and, and suffering she's going through as a leader who has lost her entire family at that point. Point. and it wasn't just the actors who showed up and showed out of course you have an amazing score by Ludwig Göransson and Ruth E. Carter returning to produce some beautiful just stunning costumes for not only the Wakandans but also the people of Talukan just kind of designing their whole aesthetic which she did such an exceptional job with so all around this film is just spectacular and so special to me 
obviously as a black female marvel fan seeing these powerful and strong black women in these positions of authority was incredibly uh, important and validating for me um, but at the same time they weren't just two-dimensional characters they did show emotion and vulnerability which is important and i think ryan coogler absolutely nailed the portrayals of these female characters and there are a lot of people who are upset about female representation in the mcu these days calling it the mcu and all of that nonsense i don't care you know <laughs> i don't care stay mad i don't care <laughs> okay like we we've had many many years of strong powerful male representation in the comic book um, movie space i mean we have buckets and buckets of it so the idea that some people will be threatened by just a few projects featuring uh female characters in powerful positions and roles uh within these comic book uh genre is just like pathetic to me and i'm not engaging with any of it at all i mean i never really have so like mm, nothing has changed but uh yeah it's just pathetic to me get over it and if you don't like it then go elsewhere okay so now we're down to the last two guys the last two best films of the entire year of 2022 and this is where it gets tricky because here it really does come down to you know my personal preference well i mean all of this does <laughs> um but also just the impacts that these films had on me far beyond you know me watching them you know that just me ruminating on these two films and it, it just having a lasting impact i, I think that's what I, it's a tough one <laughs> it's a tough one each day i was just like oh should i swap these around like oh what am i doing here but i think i am i'm happy with this order for the last two films and i'll try and explain why but first of all let's talk about number two and here in this position we have everything everywhere all at once now this is a tricky one because i know that this is going to come out on top on a lot of people's lists but for me what it comes down to is like i said just the, the personal impacts that number one had on me was far greater than that of everything everywhere all at once but i have sung the praises of this film on numerous occasions across different videos and i will happily sing them again here as well because what the daniels were able to achieve on such a small budget mind you i keep emphasizing this because it must be said on such a small budget okay i uh, was so impressive so imaginative and so just groundbreaking truly and as i've mentioned in my previous videos like the golden globes uh, reaction and the genie awards at this point in time when i'm thinking about the best of the best of the year i'm also taking into account the impact that these projects had on the year and you know whether or not we'll be looking back in five years and we'll be thinking about these particular projects as the markers for the very best of what 2022 had to offer that is my standard for the best of the year it's not enough to just be really really great it also has to have that kind of landmark effect where you immediately identify it as a, a highlight of the year and i think every Everything, everywhere all at once absolutely falls in that category which brings us to number one finally it's time to reveal my pick for the very best film of 2022 and that is probably unsurprisingly the woman king the woman king is a film that to me I mean, this is what helps define 2022 to me. To me, to me, to me, to me, to me. <laughs> Listen, this film was met with a lot of controversy for many different reasons. And I dive into all of that in my review of the film, which you can check out on my channel. But at the end of the day, what we have here is a brilliant fantastically directed film that is centered on the real life female warriors of the Dahomey tribe and honestly the fact that a film like this even exists today is a triumph to me if you look at the black female representation that we have seen across the decades previously in Hollywood to see this stand up there as as a part of that conversation as a part of that legacy I just think 
not enough people are highlighting how incredible that is and that is extremely unfortunate especially considering the controversy that the film was met with now whilst i would have loved for more people to see the film in cinemas because i thought it was a fantastic cinema going experience i am happy to see more people checking it out on itunes and the like it absolutely deserves to be seen by a huge audience because it tells such a powerful complex multi-layered story and i think that's what kind of puts some audience members off is the fact that the Dahomey tribe aren't clear heroes or villains it's a very complicated situation as I broke down in my review once again and so it makes it difficult for people to really know where to stand when it comes to the Dahomey tribe and when it comes to the female warriors but at the end of the day I welcome this complex discussion because I think we're ready for it as a society and I think trying to hide these more complicated and unsavory aspects of the slave trade and of the history of slavery isn't doing anyone any favors it works to our disadvantage we need to open up this discussion so that we can fully analyze all aspects of what occurred during this time and also as i mentioned in my review i love the fact that this is a film that is centered on the slave trade but telling the story from a different perspective you know usually we see uh, slave stories being told from the perspective of the enslaved peoples but this time around we have the perspective of the africans you know many of whom were displaced and they lost family members and members of their tribes and communities and of course you have the fact that the Dahomey tribe actually contributed to the uh, slave trade itself so that's a very unique perspective that we don't often see in media that I was really fascinated by in this film and if that wasn't already compelling enough for you on top of all of this you have some just insanely phenomenal performances by the likes of Viola Davis and my girl <laughs> my sister <laughs> Lashana Lynch I'm, oh, again again with the MCU wasting an incredible actress how embarrassing I cannot believe they wasted Lashana Lynch like this it's just crazy but anyways anyways okay Lashana Lynch Viola Davis everyone is just fantastic in the woman king and that's added to the fact that they perform incredible feats of physical fitness <laughs> with the practical fighting sequences you know the, these battle sequences are so impressive so visceral i remember you know sitting there in the cinema hearing bones break okay hearing crunching bones and i just crawled out of my skin because it was just so well done it, it felt like you were there it was so immersive so yeah all aspects of this film are truly phenomenal and it's a crime to see how underrated it is it's a crime trying to see how it was met with so much backlash that was primarily driven by massage noir which is so unfortunate but if you haven't gotten a chance to check out the woman king i'm sure i've sung the praises of it enough but i hope you do uh, check it out and and do get something really valuable and uh, significant from this film the way that i did because to me it is absolutely deserving of the title of best film of 2022 so that's it from me guys now that i told you guys my best movies of 2022 it's time for you guys to let me know what your picks were down in the comments below and what do you think of my list let me know please be sure to subscribe to catch you videos coming up thank you guys so so much for watching i really really appreciate it and i will see you in the next one bye